We have thoroughly enjoyed sharing with you this teaching series, The Unsung Story of God, the Bible, and I pray it has been enriching and enlightening to all of you, uh, the listeners and followers of the Iprosia K Marketplace Ministry, uh, because the Holy Spirit impressed upon me uh, the need for us to not forget the importance of the precious sacred writings uh, we have called the Bible. And it's time we start really living a lifestyle of holiness uh, by adhering to sound biblical knowledge. Uh, one of the prayers that King David prayed that I believe should be our request to uh, David says in Psalms uh, 119, verse number 27, he says, Teach me thy statutes. Make me to understand the way of thy precepts. And what David was essentially saying here uh, in this verse of scripture uh, was, Lord, help me understand your original thoughts. Lord, teach me uh, the original intent. Uh, you had for mankind. In other words, God, when you made mankind, what did you have in mind? Uh, what was your desire to see uh, regarding the way we should live uh, for your glory uh, so that we can be a declaration to God's awesome creation? And so if you have been following the messages uh, within this series, the unsung story of God, the Bible, you will know uh, that we have been emphasizing six things uh, that humans enjoyed and experienced on earth, according to Genesis chapter one and chapter two. Uh, because if we really want to know the original intent and mind of God like David did, uh, then we need to really study the beginning uh, when God created heaven and earth, uh, which is found in the first book of the Bible called Genesis. And no matter what your religion is or where you come from, the book of Genesis uh, chapter one uh, and two has been an ancient writings uh, that has been accepted uh, as God's word worldwide. And it details God's original intent uh, for his creation. Uh, so we have learned uh, in Genesis chapter one and two that mankind or humans are spirits made in the image and likeness of the almighty God which means, uh, like Dr. Miles Monroe once said, uh, we don't just possess a spirit, but we are spirit beings inside of a dirt body. Yes, a spirit that is essentially who we are, a spirit that was made from God himself. So the original intent of God was not for humans to exclaim, that they were God Almighty themselves, but for humans to reflect God who made us in his image and after his own likeness, uh, which is what the concept of being Christ-like or Imago Dei is all about. Uh, that's why I say if we as humans really grasp this concept, I really believe we will begin to have a better appreciation of God, uh, ourselves, and then others. And that's why I say Genesis chapter 1 verse number 26 is the most unappreciated verse of scripture in the entire Bible. And I tell you, I pro K family, I can't emphasize this verse of scripture enough. It's just the key to unlocking the whole revelation of the Holy Bible to me. And if you are a serious uh, Bible reader, 
I think is well worth your time to do an exhaust study on Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. However, uh, secondly, uh, we learned humans uh, had dominion over all the earth. Uh, the psalmist uh, confirms Genesis chapter 1 verse number 26 uh, in Psalms chapter 8 verse 4 through 6 when he writes, Who is man that thou art mindful of him? and the son of man that thou visitest him. For thou has made him a little lower than the angels and has crowned him with glory and honor. And then it says, thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou has put all things under his feet. So as God image bearers in all the creation, we as humans were intended to act as ambassadors under God's authority as his representatives uh, here on earth. Uh, then thirdly, according to Genesis chapter 1 and 2, humans enjoyed and experienced uh, God's provision in which we learned that God's uh, provision uh, is not just food and drink. Uh, in fact, uh, the seeds, the trees, the fruits, also what was considered uh, the meat that Adam and Eve enjoyed and experienced in Genesis chapter 1 verse 29 are all biblical symbolisms to really what God's provision is all about. Uh, for Christ Jesus said in Matthews uh, the sixth chapter verses 30 through 31, therefore take no thought saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or wherewithal shall we be clothed? Uh, so we learned that God's provision is more than eating and drinking. Uh, God's provision is uh, us not being so preoccupied uh, with getting things or being so caught up and overwhelmed uh, by a temporary circumstance uh, like we learned from the story of Hagar and Ishmael uh, who were in the middle of the desert with no food or drink. Uh, yes, we learned that having no food or water is just a temporary circumstance to God uh, because the Bible says uh, while Hagar was crying and waiting for her and her son to die, uh, the Bible says God then opened the eyes of Hagar and showed her a well of water, uh, which means uh, God's provision is more about us trusting God in the midst of all of our circumstances, uh, no matter what the odds are. Uh, we must know that our God is well able and he can do the impossible. Uh, so when it comes to God's provision, uh, it's all about us not giving up, but continuing to walk by faith and not by sight. Uh, see, despite the situation or the circumstances, uh, we got to keep walking by faith and keep our spiritual eyes open uh, to see and experience God's reality uh, for God has the provision uh, we need in the midst of the desert places in our lives. Oh, glory. Hallelujah. Uh, then the fourth thing uh, we learned in this series, the unsung story of God. Uh, we learned that mankind up until Genesis uh, chapter six experienced and enjoyed the spirit of God within them. Uh, yes, all humans in the beginning uh, had the spirit of God dwelling on the inside of them and the Holy Spirit of God uh, dwelling on the inside of humans is important uh, because in Genesis chapter six, verse number three, God says something uh, that many Bible readers miss and don't correlate to why Christ Jesus had to come. God says in verse number three, my spirit shall not. And let me repeat, 
shall not always scribe with man, for that he also is flesh. Uh, so we learn two important things. Number one, because of sin, uh, mankind experienced a disconnect from God and lost communion uh, with God's Holy Spirit. And then number two, this is why Christ Jesus uh, in the Gospel of John chapter 16, uh, verse number seven tells us uh, it is expedient for you. In other words, Christ says it's for our benefit that he go away or ascend back to the Father. For is Christ Jesus go not away, then the Comforter will not come unto us. Which means Christ Jesus' resurrection uh, and his ascension uh, was necessary so that God's Spirit uh, would return unto us. <laughs> we know this to be true because in the book of Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, when the believers were gathered together in one place, the Bible says the Holy Spirit came in like a rushing mighty wind and everyone was filled with the Holy Spirit. So this is the reason uh, Christ Jesus had to come. So mankind can have the Holy Spirit dwelling on the inside of them again. Oh, I hope you receive that. And in all of your getting, get understanding about the importance of having the Holy Spirit dwell on the inside of you. And then next, uh, the fifth thing we learned was humans had access to the designated territory of God called the Garden of Eden, or what I like to call the Garden of Eden, God's resort. Uh, yes, the Garden of Eden uh, is very significant uh, because this is the actual uh, physical location on earth that God chose for human uh, civilization to begin. Yes, this is the territory or place on earth known today as the fertile crescent of civilization. Uh, but during Adam and Eve day, this actual place on earth was apparently the kind of atmosphere and environment uh, that God originally intended uh, for mankind. Uh, a place where mankind can begin the colonization uh, and the spreading of the kingdom of God all around the earth. Because since uh, humans had God's spirit uh, dwelling within them, uh, it was God's intent uh, that we as mankind would make heaven visible on earth uh, by having constant fellowship uh, with God, uh, which brings us uh, to the last part of this series and is what I believe the expectation that God uh, still has of us today. And that is in Genesis chapter 2, verse number 15, God's original intent was for mankind to manage the Garden of Eden. Uh, for it says in verse number 15, and the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Let me say that again. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Now, most people who are new to the Bible or who just started uh, their journey trying to uh, get understanding from the Bible uh, would probably read over uh, that verse without digging into it. So most people probably uh, will or have uh, missed uh, the inference of God placing Adam uh, in the garden to dress it and to keep it. Uh, because at first glance, uh, it just appears uh, that this verse possibly means that God gave Adam uh, a shovel uh, and a rake and sent him out into the field uh, to plow it uh, and till it, 
till up the land. Uh, but when we look at this verse number 15, uh, what it actually means to dress it, uh, this Hebrew meaning of dress it means a whole lot more than just the physical aspect of work. Uh, for number one, uh, it means to embellish. And the word embellish uh, means to make more attractive or more interesting by adding more details. Now, if you really think about that, it may seem strange because that would insinuate that Adam and Eve was to take care of the garden so well that it would become better than it was when God gave it to them. However, that's exactly uh, what to dress it or to embellish implies here in this verse of scripture. I know that's a hard pill uh, to swallow, uh, but that, my dear hearts, is the revelation of the Holy Spirit uh, that you can't miss. I remember uh, growing up and my grandparents uh, used to tell us, if someone lend you something or let you borrow something uh, to use, then bring it back better than the way they gave it to you. Meaning make sure before you give it back that it's still in good shape or working good, if not better, and clean. Yeah, that's what my grandparents uh, used to say. And I believe somewhat the same sentiments of God uh, when he placed Adam and Eve in the garden. He placed them there uh, to manage his creation uh, and his expectation was for them to take good care of it, even make it more attractive and more interesting because we must understand and hear me good when I say we must understand we are here on this earth to make it a better place. For the glory of God period that's why God gave us different gifts uh, and talents so we can use these gifts and talents to make this earth a better place uh, you see God uh, did not originally intend uh, for us to pollute this earth uh, with lasting distress uh, and sufferings or to poison this earth uh, with disastrous, senseless, tragic loss uh, and deep misery. Uh, however, our purpose as mankind here on this earth is to use God's gifts and talents to make it a better place. Also, another thing we can glean from uh, this Hebrew meaning behind the phrase to dress it uh, and to keep it uh, because it's not only means to work, uh, to take care of, to guard, or to watch over, uh, but it carries greater implications like uh, to cultivate, uh, to maintain, to be faithful to, to worship, and to serve. Yes, to worship and to serve. Now, those have more spiritual connotations to it uh, when it comes to what dress it and keep it means. And this is why I believe we should take managing what God gave to us more serious uh, because the truth of the matter, God is still enforcing this mandate onto us today. Uh, we are here on earth to work together in order to manage and make God's creation better. That's what our worship and service unto God is all about, uh, to apply ourselves uh, to the care of every single bit of creation that God has graciously gave unto mankind and to manage uh, the operation of it by making his kingdom visible all over earth. You see, although 
the garden did require a great deal of physical work uh, to maintain, to cultivate, uh, and to keep still from a spiritual perspective. Mankind was not only supposed to preserve or control and direct it, but also to scribe even to enhance the garden. Uh, so in uh, this last message of our series, The Unsung Story of God, the Bible, we need to know that mankind was put on this earth to manage it by making it a better place. And so part of our worship and service to God is to carry out this managing duty given to man in the beginning. Yes, we should understand that applying ourselves uh, physically uh, to the greater good of things on this earth uh, to make it better uh, is the spiritual work we all must render as service and worship unto God Almighty. I believe that is why Christ Jesus uh, would say things like, no one who puts his hand uh, to the plow and look back is fit for the kingdom of God. Uh, because just like the meaning of dress it and keep it, uh, this verse of scripture uh, has a physical and a spiritual aspect to it. In fact, Christ Jesus even uh, said in John the 14th chapter and the 12th verse, truly, truly, I say unto you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do and greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. Wow, now that's a huge statement there by Christ. And I know if you like me, when you uh, read verses of scripture like this, you have to ask yourself, how in the world can you and I do greater works than what Christ Jesus did? I mean, uh, when you think about the fact that he performed miracles, uh, healed the sick, and even raised the dead, what kind of works can I do greater than these? And so if you are asking uh, this question uh, that I once had, I'm going to tell you what the Holy Spirit shared uh, with me some years ago now uh, when I was really uh, grappling with God about my calling and I couldn't understand uh, why God was not using me uh, in certain spiritual gifts uh, that I witnessed uh, so many other pastors uh, and leaders uh, in the church operating in. Uh, and so uh, the Holy Spirit had me to read uh, 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, over and over again until I finally realized and understood that love is the greatest gift I can have. Because the 13th chapter of Corinthians tells us, if I speak with tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And so it then when God spoke and help me understand uh, that the only gift that I needed uh, to be concerned about operating uh, within was love. Uh, because it became clear when I read the end of 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, where it says, and now about a faith, hope, charity, uh, these three, but the greatest of these is charity and from that moment on i understood what the greatest gift was and that was the gift of charity and so the holy spirit spoke to me and helped me understand 
that God wants us all as believers to seek after operating in the gift of love. And as I began to look back over the years past, I saw how God was already using me in this capacity. And so for me, it became a more passionate uh, pursuit of mine uh, to try to operate in this gift of love and also try to teach the importance of this gift of love. Uh, we all as believers should be operating in. For trust me when I tell you, God has certainly performed greater works for me and through me since I have really made uh, operating in the gift of love uh, my heart's posture. And it is definitely uh, my belief, I pro K family, uh, that this gift of love should be every believer's primary focus uh, when it comes to what the Bible means about the word works uh, that we must render to fulfill our mandate of God here on this earth. That's why our ministry model is still love the creator and love thy neighbor. Yes, it is love we need in order for our light to shine before men that they might see our good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. Yes, it is love, I tell you, that is going to help us not to rejoice in iniquity, but rejoice in truth so that we may worship God in truth and in spirit. Uh, yes, this is the only way we can truly honor and serve God based on what he originally intended. And that is with genuine love uh, that aims to make uh, this world a better place. Uh, yes, with genuine love, I tell you, that beareth all things, uh, believeth all things, hopeth all things, uh, endureth all things, and with love that never faileth. So I approach K family, I close uh, this series of messages by admonishing each of you to understand when we yield and humble and apply ourselves to pursuing and sharing uh, this gift of love that only God can stir up within us. That's what will help us to be good managers and good stewards of God and lead us to doing greater works that will make this world a better place. Again, I have thoroughly enjoyed sharing uh, this series of messages, the unsung story of God, the Bible, and I pray that he who has ears to hear, let him hear the word of the Lord. I'm Pastor KD. God bless you. I love you. Until next time, grace be unto you.